I make this video as a tribute to Lawrence Patton McDonald or better known as Larry McDonald. Some of you might have heard of Larry McDonald who tragically died in a plane that was downed, a Korean Airlines plane. And I will just read you a brief history on him. And in this video, you will find clips, a compilation of clips of him speaking and saying things that are very, very true to what we experience in the world today. And he was a Democrat. And this many people will find interesting. And it says here, and this is in Wikipedia, Lawrence Payton MacDonald was born on April 1st, 1935, and he died on September 1st, 1983. He was an American politician and a member of the United States House of Representatives representing Georgia's 7th Congressional District as a Democrat from 1975 until he was killed while a passenger on board Korean Airlines Flight 007 when it was shot down by Soviet interceptors. McDonald maintained one of the most conservative voting records in Congress and crusaded against communism. He became chairman of the John Birch Society in 1983, months before his death. He was remembered as a martyr by the American conservatives. Now today you won't be able to reconcile the word conservative and democrat. Uh, the American politics is a complete and utter mess. They don't actually understand the meaning of words anymore. But I don't want to keep you up any further. The first uh, portion of the video that you will see will be about Larry McDonald, what happened to him, uh, a member of the John Birch Society actually uh, speaking about uh, what uh, came out in the news, what we actually know, which is very little, and the, the many different stories. Uh, not just stories, but news publications that came out on what happened to the plane. And uh, this has certainly started many conspiracy theories. But certainly, if you listen to the words of this man, you will see why he could have been a target on that plane and why that plane could have been taken down, maybe, by people closer to him than the Russians. Thank you so much. Enjoy this video. Larry was lost in Korean Flight 7, and uh, that happened on a Monday or Tuesday, but that weekend I had dinner with him before he left, and he was not planning on going. Among those presumed dead, United States Senator Larry McDonald, and at least 30, possibly 40 other Americans, and an Australian family of four. Uh, we were sending some people over to Korea to re uh, represent uh, the United States in a mutual defense tra uh, treaty that we have with South Korea. And uh, Larry was going, but he got so busy, he finally told uh, Jesse Helms, there was two people from the Senate going and two people from the House. I think the other House was uh, a congressman from Idaho. And uh, Larry, at that weekend, decided, I just can't go. Well, the next day, Jesse Helms called him and said, Larry, we need you there. This is critical. We need you there to re represent us so the left's going to make some drastic moves. So Larry changed his mind and he went. I ask you, are we really willing to give away the Panama Canal? Do Americans want a national defense system that falls short of being number one in the world? Are, willing, are Americans willing to stake their future security on a nuclear arms treaty that doesn't require on-site inspection? I remember when I heard uh, the news, uh, I, I mean, the world just stopped for me. I, I, I couldn't believe it when I said the plane was down and Larry Contlery, a big daughter, was on that, that plane. Still to this day, we don't know what, ha what completely happened. It's still a big question mark. And I think it's interesting that uh, in the 90s, uh, the Pravda, uh, the Russian newspaper, came out with an article on uh, Korean Flight 7. And it talked about that uh, the plane had landed. And uh, there was you know, some speculation that they still had control of that plane after it had been hit by a missile and had landed on Sakhalin Island and that uh, the, uh, uh, they had uh, parked the plane, stripped all the electronics off it, then pushed the plane off into the ocean. 
never mentioned anything about survivors, anybody, injuries, nothing. Nothing it, was ever mentioned. Their black box showed they made a controlled descent. Yes, and so that, it that didn't. In, that information came out too. And there was a, uh, a Jewish author that was watching Russia and his, uh, I guess, life's work was to spot every one of the uh, gulags or concentration camps they had all throughout Russia. And he was cataloging to keep track of them. And he would interview people that escaped from these gulags to find out exactly how they lived, where it was located, how they got out, etc. And he started getting reports from these people that he interviewed about uh, a large group of people turning up at uh, one of the gulags. And they kept it separated from everybody, but the word kind of spread that they were uh, uh, off, they, they were on an airplane. Didn't mention what plane it was or anything. And that, then the, the word also got back that there was one man they kept separated from even the surviving passengers and everybody. And from the description, it, looked, it was a, it had to be Larry McDonald. And, uh, but nothing more was said about it. Uh, it just kind of died out over the period of time. And uh, we just know it's a fact of history right now that something happened to Flight 7. But Larry was a tremendous leader for the conservative movement in Congress. Uh, to move to discredit the John Burt Society and frankly launched uh, initial orders coming out of Moscow. Well, uh, Mr. McDonald, I'm not a conspirator. Uh, I think even Buchanan would vouch for that. Uh, well, but you uh, are Robert, a Robert Council Welch, Foreign Relations. Robert you're Welch. No, I don't think so. Yeah, I'm a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Yeah, you, well, you've certainly. Well, it, let me just tell you what Newsweek yeah. says. That says this: the John Birch Society considers communism only one arm of a national of a master conspiracy in which socialist American insiders are plotting to establish world government. Now, it also says, and here's Director John McManus. That's your public relations director saying that former Secretary of State Alexander Haig and CIA Director William Casey are two of these master conspirators who are plotting to establish world government. Now, what do you say? Uh, you know, that kind of silly, asinine statement is what makes, pe makes people laugh at the John Birch Society. Well, Tom, I'm sure being a long-standing member of the Rockefeller apparatus, uh, and as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations of Longstanding, you're fully aware that you, there is an elitist core in this country that has seen value in subsidizing communism or protecting communism. It has? Sure. You're accusing me of subsidizing communism? No, no, I'm saying because that Because I happen is, to belong no, to a no, to there a is an elite policy core. study no, group? No, no, wait a minute. There is an elite core in this country that has dominated American society. Well, I'm not one of them. Well, I mean, trilateral French. Commission. A trilateral Council Commission. On Council Relations. on Foreign Relations. State here's Department, a, I suppose. Well, let's face it. They've dominated the State Department for 40 years, mm -hmm. and uh, pretty much openly All so. right, but what are they trying to do? Council well, their now? objective is to try to bring about a gradual transition in our society, a dissolving of sovereignty, and a moving steadily to the left on the political spectrum. Well, who are the they? Belief the elitist groups that I mentioned, particularly key individuals and policymakers in the Council on Foreign Relations. Is the International Monetary Fund part of this? Well, I would say the International Monetary Fund has certainly been set up for the purpose of facilitating that transfer of sovereignty and transfer of wealth on the road. Right, we elected the Mr. Conservative. Let me just finish the point, right. because otherwise we're going to have a lot of un unanswered questions, that you are looking at a group that has worked to bring about the dissolution of national sovereignties on the road to world government. It is interesting to note that three months after laying out the strong links between the CFR, the UN, and the CIA, as well as Soviet Russia, in this broadcast, Congressman McDonald was killed in the Russian shootdown of Korean Airlines Flight 007 over international waters. Uh, he had actually organized uh, several congressmen, congressmen so they could do better work on checking legislation 
particularly uh, constitutional legislation. And uh, what Larry said, that the flood of legislation is so heavy and some of the bills are so long, there's no way any one congressman can study it and read it and know exactly what's in it. So they each took different legislative sections and used their staff to read it, study it, and they report it back to each other. That way they kept it all so forth. And I understand he had about eight congressmen that they were doing that with. And he was in line also to be the uh, head of the House Armed Services Committee if he got elected one more time. He would head seniority. And, and what's your theory about, like, if you believe he was killed intentionally, which the Soviets shot him down, what's your theory on if it was a targeted killing? Do you think that the U.S. put the Soviets up to do it because he was in high places? Do you think the Soviets did it? Well, I think the Soviets did it. Uh, that night, after we went, after I heard about this, there were the early morning reports that came out uh, before anybody ever woke up, because you were on the other side of the world that time, uh, were saying that the flight had, uh, the Korean Flight 7 had been shot at, and that uh, American congressman was, was on there. And uh, it originally would have been that all four of them, Senator uh, uh, Jesse Helms, uh, another senator, Larry McDonald, and the congressman from Idaho uh, would all been on the same plane. But Larry, because of weather, was in Atlanta and he missed the flight in New York that they were all supposed to be on. So that flight left and Larry was on the next flight behind it. And actually, they landed in Alaska to refuel, but they didn't know where Larry was on this plane and Larry didn't know they were on that plane ahead of him. And uh, Larry had fallen asleep on the plane and just stayed there as they refueled in it. Uh, or all four of them would have been on the same plane. Well, when they took off, they took off about 30 minutes apart. And Larry was the trail plane. And they, Now, the question was, were they over uh, international waters or not? Uh, that, that has not been answered. There has been, the question came up that uh, they had checked the uh, guidance device of the plane and they find it to be faulty. Maybe caused them to go off course. Maybe even rigged. We don't know. It's some of the speculation that came about. And uh, anyway, the Russian pilot was flying. And according to this uh, one report, it was early in the morning. And they played the report and, and translated. And he asked for permission. What plane should I get? And nothing came back. And he came back and said, he said, the first plane is getting ready to head up in international waters and the second plane is behind them. What am I supposed to do? And they came back and said, there's three of them on the first plane, there's one on the second plane, get the second plane. That's the one he took a shot at. I talked to some people inside the airlines. I uh, can't mention their names. I had a promise to them, and they, they told me that uh, that's what they uh, find inside the airlines, uh, what the story was, and that whole story was killed within 24 hours. It just disappeared off the press. Do you think that the Americans had kind of advanced knowledge? Because I've heard some theories that the U.S. put the Russians up to shoot McDonald out of the sky because he was making problems for them. Well, I, I don't know. I can't answer that. I know he was going to be the head of the, of the House Armed Services Committee, and they absolutely did not want that uh, because they were trying to tear our defenses down. And Larry wanted to make sure that our defenses protected the United States, and he was working towards that goal. And Jesse Holmes was working on that same thing. And uh, the other two congressmen, or the other, the other congressmen, were uh, working for that same thing too. That's why they wanted to be over there, to ensure South Korea, we were going to not let uh, North Korea, the Russians, take over the country. On August 31st, the Soviet Union shot down an unarmed civilian jetliner, murdering 269 innocent people, including Congressman Lawrence P. McDonald. Yet some congressmen 
would still want to appease the Soviet Union by supporting a nuclear freeze that would make the Soviets more powerful and allow them to kill more innocent people. To find out if your congressman is voting to appease the Soviet Union with a nuclear freeze, call 1-800-331-1000. week says, that, says this, the John Birch Society considers communism only one arm of a national, of a master conspiracy in which socialist American insiders are plotting to establish world government. Now, it also says, and here's Director John McManus, that's your public relations director, saying that former Secretary of State Alexander Haig and CIA Director William Casey are two of these master conspirators who are plotting to establish world government. Now, what do you say? Uh, you know, that kind of silly, asinine statement is what makes pe make people laugh at the John Birch Society. Well, Tom, I'm sure, being a long-standing member of the Rockefeller apparatus, uh, and as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations of long-standing, you're fully aware that you, there is an elitist core in this country that has seen value in subsidizing communism or protecting communism. It has? Sure. You're accusing me of subsidizing communism? No, no, I'm saying because that there is... Because I happen to belong no, to a... No, to there a is an elite core. Study no, that, group? No, no, wait a minute. There is an elite core in this country that has dominated American society. Well, I'm not one of them. Well, the Trilateral face. Commission. The Trilateral Council Commission, on Council Relations. on Foreign Relations. State Here's Department, I suppose. Well, let's face it, they have dominated the State Department for 40 years, mm -hmm. and uh, pretty much openly All so. right, but what are they trying to do? Come well, their now. objective is to try to bring about a gradual transition in our society, a dissolving of sovereignty, and a moving steadily to the left on the political spectrum. Well, who are the they? Belief the elitist groups that I mentioned, particularly key individuals and policymakers in the Council on Foreign Relations. Is the International Monetary Fund part of this? Well, I would say the International Monetary Fund has certainly been set up for the purpose of facilitating that transfer of sovereignty and transfer of wealth on the road. Right, we elected Mr. Conservative. Let me just finish the point, right. because otherwise we're going to have a lot of un unanswered questions, that you are looking at a group that has worked to bring about the dissolution of national sovereignties on the road to world government. And certainly uh, you're familiar with the uh, local professor, Carol Quigley, who has been part of your club, in which he admitted all this. And he said in his book, Tragedy and Hope, the only thing I disagree is that we've worked to keep it a secret. Once again, we'll remind you that Congressman McDonald will be in Chickamauga this morning at 9, Fort Oglethorpe at 10.30, Ringgold at 2. Whether you agree with him or not, I'm sure he'd like to meet you and hear your views. Uh, we were talking about the Atlanta Papers a minute ago. One of the big complaints they have about you, and not just them, but, but people who are opposed to you say that although you do express your beliefs well, that you are not an effective congressman, that you're a lone voice in the wilderness, uh, you're a maverick, that anything you support is sometimes considered a joke by other congressmen. What do you think about those sorts of Oh, it's of very easy. They, all you have to do is ask for a definition of the word effective. Effective at what? Uh, now, they say, oh, you know me, effective at passing laws. Well, I personally believe that we don't need a lot more laws. I think we've got far too many laws on the books now. That's part of the problem. Our government is far too... We don't need more government, more laws. We need a lot less. I'm up there trying to dismantle a lot of this giant government. But let's stop and just think about when you, quote, pass a law with the current attitude in the Congress, what do you get in a law today? You get either more spending or more taxes or more controls. That's the three things. Well, let me ask you, which do you want? you want more spending? Uh, I think we've got too much. Do you want more taxes? I think we're taxed too heavily now. Do you want more controls over your life? Does, does anybody say, hey, look, I really believe the federal government needs to control me. I want to be a slave. Please tell me how to run every facet of my life. I don't hear many people saying that. I think most people say, I think it's time we get the government off our backs and out of our pockets. Yes, I think the people who believe that the welfare state is a disaster, the people who are trying to slow down this humongous growth in the federal government and the stifling of the American dream, uh, these are viewed as the mavericks. These are viewed, uh, Congressman Phil Crane is viewed as being not effective. Congressman John Ashbrook, one of the great Americans of this century, prior to his recent strange, tragic death, uh, was an individual who was constantly criticized as being not effective. And today, to be effective, you have to be one of those saying, more government, more spending, and more controls, more taxes, and I'm not part of that breed, and I'll uh, readily admit to that. Why do you think that the public who 
most people say we don't want more government. I mean, almost everybody says that. We want less government. Why do they put up with increased government intervention? Why do they put up with it? I think that, uh, you know, Joseph de Maistre said, except he said it in French about 200 years ago, that you get the kind of government you deserve. And I think that's true. I think the problem today is that we do not have an informed electorate. The average good person on the street, the average good citizen, black and white, Democrat, Republican, young and old, doesn't have the foggiest idea of what is going on and their response to it. Okay, and we're out of time, Congressman. We appreciate you coming. Wish we had more time. We need another hour or so. Yeah, nice to be with you. Basis or system of prosperity, which came to be known as a free enterprise system. I think it gains its strength not because it is a system, but because of the lack of a system. In short, the government was to stay off your back and out of your pockets or to stay away from the farms, away from the businesses, away from the professions. The government was not to be involved. We've seen a great change in my lifetime, certainly in the 20th century, away from the limitations placed upon our society by a constitution and most particularly a Bill of Rights, which were essentially negative documents restricting the growth and activities of government. Today we find the federal government involved in the professions, telling doctors how to doctor, and telling teachers how to teach, and as one wag said, uh, telling carpenters how to carp. But <clears throat> we have seen the tremendous growth in government in the 20th century, an explosive gro growth far beyond the boundaries imposed by our Constitution. Today there's hardly a single area of activity in this country or indeed around the world where the United States federal government is not involved. This has produced, of course, an explosive growth in the cost of government. Politicians are reluctant to raise the taxes directly to pay for that explosive growth. <clears throat> this means deficits. And out of the deficits, we have a growing national debt, where today just servicing that debt has become the third largest item in the federal budget. And to further service the debt and the creation of new money, we have had the development of a central banking apparatus, in this case, the Federal Reserve System. Now, our founding fathers had a great argument over this point of the question of a central bank. And there's been argument down through uh, the decades on this point. But one thing that is very clear with the development of this, it has become the engine of inflation. Thomas Jefferson, in warning about the question of a federal debt, had this to say. I place economy among the first and most important virtues, and public debt as the greatest of dangers to be feared. To preserve our independence, we must make our election between economy and liberty or profusion and ser servitude. If we run into such debts, we must be taxed in our meat and drinks, in our necessities and comforts, in our labors and our amusements. If we can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of caring for them, they must become happy. I think the emphasis on that has to be that last sentence, that if we can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of caring for them, they must become happy. Now with this explosive growth of new money, that means, of course, inflation. Now I know that many people are being led to believe that politicians in Washington during the political season are going to save us from the ravages of inflation. Perhaps if you only remember one thing tonight, I hope you will remember at least this, that politicians do not fear inflation. They love it because inflation is the mechanism that allows them to expand the currency, to satisfy, to make up the deficits that allow them to pay for the expanding federal program to satisfy the special interest groups to guarantee their elections. Politicians do not fear inflation. They love it. It is the mechanism for buying votes, in so many cases, to ensure their re-elections. So many people today are, have the attitude that inflation is a problem of rising prices. Indeed, we are led to believe that this is the case. 
And as long as we lack an understanding of basic issues, we will continue to be plagued with problems like inflation. But saying that inflation is like rising prices is just about as foolish as saying that wet streets cause rain. It's the other way around. Inflation is an increase in the money supply. Who causes inflation? Well, two groups. Counterfeiters can cause inflation when they run off pieces of paper in their basement, printing them up, passing them out in society, because by so doing, they steal from society as a whole. Federal government, to make up the deficits, servicing the deficits, and creating new money, whether by direct printing press or bookkeeping entry or borrowing from the capital markets, also is passing out new money without backing. The principle of immorality remains the same. Counterfeiters, we catch them, we put them in jail. In the case of government, we frequently return the politicians to office, praising them as great humanitarians in their process of expanding the money supply. This tremendous growth in inflation, in government, has brought us the deficits and debt exactly that as feared by Thomas Jefferson and many other of our founding fathers, to where today we have the greatest debt in the history of the world, approaching officially one trillion dollars. But you know, when you go to in the areas of unfunded liability, you're looking at a debt approaching eight or nine trillion dollars. If you handle the government accounting in the same way that you would handle in the case of a private business or profession, in the area of promises made but money not in the till, you're looking at a massive debt of seven, eight, or nine trillions of dollars. <clears throat> the interest on the debt is today the third largest item, as I mentioned, in the national debt, in our national budget, costing us at a rate of over $2,300 per second, 60 seconds to the minute, 60 minutes to the hour, 24 hours a day, 365 and a quarter days a year. You know, just to cover this takes about $60,000 in time just to review the massive importance of the cost of the taxpayers just by that third segment of the, of the budget. With the growth of government, we have seen a strangulation of our productive society with agencies such as EPA, OSHA, and many others, that vast alphabet soup in Washington. We're finding that American productivity is grounding down to the level of stagnation. Competing countries such as West Germany, Switzerland, and Japan are expanding their productive capability per person at a rate of 10, 12 percent steadily right along. This has meant that in the competitive world of the world markets, that we find that American goods have increasing difficulties. Well, the simple answer that many people propose is the way to solve this, of course, is just simply higher tariffs. But you know, the last time we adopted that philosophy was back during the late 20s, early 30s, and with the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Acts. Most economists will agree that the great worldwide depression was linked to the tariff wars of that period. There wasn't anything very good about the last great worldwide depression, and I certainly don't think that many of us would agree that we need another one today. There's been a basic shift in the philosophy of our society and philosophy of government away from the concept of the government's function to protect life and property and over to a concept of government being the agent for the redistribution of income. Today, 60% of the federal budget activity, of the federal government's activity, is that category known as transfer payments. This is where you use the power of government to take money from those who earned it and transfer it over to those who did not. This means that in the process of doing that, we're increasingly penalizing the productive sector and subsidizing the non-productive sector. So that the government's major function today is that of being the leveler of society in the redistribution of income. Now, one thing is very clear in reading the writings of our founding fathers, in writing the Constitution and in adding the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, 
They did everything they could to make the leveling of society as a function of government unconstitutional. Today, that's 60% of the federal activity. You know, I speak to a lot of high school and student groups. I frequently ask the students in philosophical terms, what is the proper function of the federal government? The typical answer is that government today is, should provide me with those things that I feel that I need that I cannot provide for myself. Unfortunately, this is not an atypical answer. This is the traditional or typical answer. This has brought about a tremendous change where more and more people are being led to believe, you know, it's a lot easier to vote yourself a living than it is to work for a living. I think the growing welfare roles reflects the continuing attitude of government's function as a provider rather than a protector.